on episode 635 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Georgia Ede and discuss her book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, a powerful plan to improve mood, overcome anxiety, and protect memory for a lifetime of optimal mental health. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 635. Have you decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness? The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Coach Allen. I'm an NASM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, performance enhancement, and fitness nutrition. A Precision Nutrition Level 1 coach, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA Level 2 online trainer. Each week, I'm joined by our co-host, Coach Rachel. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hey, Raz, how are you? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Um, Tammy uh, had a surgery. She had sinus issues, uh, Im impacted sinuses. Um, it, was, it was related to fungus. Um, and so at some time in her life, and it may have been when we bought, had the house in Pensacola Beach, because we did have black mold yeah. there. She had mm -hmm. surgery back then. And so, you know, her doctor said this is about a 10 year cycle for people that have had this surgery before to have to come back. And hers has been about, about that. So uh, she mm -hmm. went in, they, they got a, uh, a mass out of her sinus that was a fungus and it was uh, about the size of a golf ball. Oh, my and gosh. so <laughs> she's, uh, she's still in Panama city. Uh, she's recovering. Mm -hmm. She's got to go in for uh, a couple checks. She went in yesterday to have the, all the packing pulled out. Um, and so she'll recover for a, a few more days and go back uh, Friday or Saturday to get checked out again. And then maybe then she can catch a bus over. Um, oh, and I'll see my wife. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> it's, doubt. Oh. Been over, it's been over two weeks. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a tough one, but, um, you know, everything's going well, um, Good. here, uh, how Good. are things up there? Good. Beautiful. Spring is coming again, maybe fall spring, but <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. Uh, up here. Gotcha. Gotcha again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. But, uh, similar to Tammy, I I'll be having a surgery in about a week or so myself. And I had my pre-op phone call this morning and every now and then, Alan, I just feel like I'm really happy that I'm as healthy as I am because I, it's only a general anesthesia. It's not a big deal. This it, I'm having an eye surgery. It's, it should only last 45 minutes. It's not a big procedure, but they go through this laundry list of things, heart murmurs or issues, um, anemic, diabetic, you know, all these things, what medicines are you taking? Like they go through this list from head to toe of all these conditions. And I'm like, I'm really glad I'm answering no, because you know, I, I'm as healthy as I am because then I wonder otherwise what kind of protocols they'd have to line up for a risky surgery. So I guess I'm just grateful for being as healthy as I am to be able to weather this. And it's nice to hear that from yeah. your doctor that you're healthy enough to have a surgery because geez, I just wonder how it would be otherwise. Yeah. Well, the, the vast majority of people have at least one metabolic deficiency problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it could be like you said, high blood pressure, high yeah. cholesterol, high, mm -hmm. um, you know, heart, heart issues, um, liver issues, something, you know, almost everybody has a little bit of something going on. Mm -hmm. And so they, yeah, they have to ask and they have to ask what medications you're on. And yep. when you're in your fifties and you're not on any medications, they look at you like you're a unicorn. I kind of felt like a unicorn answering all these questions. Like, Holy cow. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so just mm -hmm. keeping yourself you either getting healthy or keeping yourself healthy are, are two of the key points. And so sure. you know, if you, people are looking to lose weight. They do it now, do it now. Mm -hmm. Waiting, waiting will not help you. It will not right. do anything for you. And all the stuff we've learned, you know, the, the, with COVID coming through 
it was it was the people with comorbidities. It was people with mm-hmm. these metabolic issues that, that were the ones that were dying. The old, well, mm-hmm. and the old, really really old, but the, it, you the people who were dying had usually had some form of illness uh, that basically was what did them in. And so yeah. this is your you have an opportunity every single day to do something just a little different. Um, exactly. So if you haven't, like please please do. Yeah, for sure. All right. Were you ready to have a conversation with, um, with the doctor? Sure. All right. Our guest today is an internationally recognized expert in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. Her 25 years of clinical experience include 12 years at Smith College and Harvard University Health Services, where she was the first to offer students nutrition-based approaches as an alternative to psychiatric medication. She co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for treatment-resistant mental illnesses, developed the first medically accredited course in ketogenic diets for mental health practitioners, and was honored to be named the recipient of the Bazooki Brain Research Fund's first annual Metabolic Mind Award. With no further ado, here's Dr. Georgia Eid. Dr. Eid, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so your book, your book is called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, a powerful plan to improve mood, overcome anxiety, and protect memory for a lifetime of optimal mental health. Um, I've had a topic of mental health on before, but it was really more in the lines of how exercise can benefit the brain uh, and help us with some of these issues. It's so interesting to me because... <laughs> Well, of course, our current medical establishment will put much more credibility into a very small pill <laughs> when we're <laughs> when we're taking in these large volumes of chemicals elsewhere in our lives. And it's like, no, the food can't help you. You have to take this this little chemical pill that, you know, I, it's it's just it's always been odd to me that we've always I mean, even even hypocrisies. Was, I mean, yeah, it wasn't he's like, let food be thy medicine. And it's, it's so interesting that, well, because they, maybe they can't make money selling this stuff. They don't, they don't even try like, no, we have to find a chemical. <laughs> we can't just tell you, <laughs> we can't just tell you to eat a particular way or avoid certain foods uh, and your brain's going to work better. Um, so again, I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you because this is just a fascinating topic. Well, I love that image you just painted in my mind because I haven't thought about it like that before. You know, here you are eating these, you know, large quantities of substances three, four, five, six times a day compared to this tiny little pill. Do you really think the pill is any match for whatever problems you, there might be in, in, in your diet? And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's really, uh, it's a really important way to think about it is that, you know, if you, if you restructure your diet from the ground up in ways that make biological sense, uh, if you have the right information, it's a really powerful intervention. It, it can really help you uh, with mental health conditions, great and small, um, in ways that no medicine can. Um, but you just have to have the right information, know which changes are the ones that are worth making. Yeah. One one of the things that it, it's, it's, it's frustrating, and I, I kind of wish that they would use their names, the actual names of the people, instead of the organizations that they happen to represent at the time. Mm. Just how polluted nutrition science is with flat out, in some cases, falsehoods and, and false um, comparisons and false equivalents. And it just, it, it's so frustrating. I, I, I almost hate talking about it, but it is so important to understand that what we think of sometimes as nutrition science isn't really science at all, but is rather uh, what you used in a word in a book I love called dietary ideology, because I think it really blends into what's going on now. We see how ideologies can just drive people off kind of a deep end of sorts, but it's, it's pervasive and it's getting worse. It, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, ideology, belief systems and wishful thinking and what we wish were true about diet. I mean, those are powerful forces. You know, I'm a psychiatrist, so I, I understand feelings and beliefs are really powerful. Um, but uh, th- these are ideologies. And even I would go so far as to say mythology, um, uh, not biology. 
So when you look at the biology, everything's crystal clear. Nutrition is not rocket science. It's it's really quite simple, you know, but but the reason I had to write a whole book about it was because so much of what we've been told is completely upside down and backwards. And if you simply give the biological, if you give the biology information, I mean, it might take me, you know, one chapter to do that. Uh, it's not that not that difficult, but the problem is then you have to deal with what about this? Why have I heard this? Isn't this bad for me? But I heard about this. And so you have to deal with and take down and show people, you know, why? Why is it that, you know, you're telling us not to eat whole grains? Why is it that you're telling us that we should eat more fat and less carbohydrate? Why is it you're telling us that red meat is actually good for you? Uh, when I've heard these 100 things you yeah. know, that are incorrect. So that's, that's what you have to spend most of your time doing is uneducating before you can, you, know, you have to kind of wipe the slate, the slate clean before you can start fresh. Yeah, and, and the history of it, I, I don't, I, you know, you quoted Gary Taubes a lot in his book called The Case Against Sugar. Uh, he just recently came out with another book and it's, um, it's called uh, Rethinking Diabetes. And he literally goes through kind of the history and it's so so oh, interesting that, you know, they, they happened upon the ketogenic diet as a way to treat diabetes because someone saw it's like, well, they're having a problem with blood sugar. Let's just eat less of that. Um, that. <laughs> <laughs> who would have thunk, but a doctor did and it worked and it worked, you know, it, it helped. And, but they, they wouldn't go so far as to say you should eat this way because the American Heart Association had already said that this was going to cause everybody to have heart attacks if they ate this way. We knew it worked for epilepsy. Now we had some evidence that it worked for um, type 2 diabetes, but they squashed it. They basically just squashed it and said, this protocol can't work. And then insulin came along and kind of just kind of made the point mute. We have a medicine now. We don't have to worry about what you eat. Um in fact, we need you eating more sugar, so you need more insulin, so we can sell more insulin. And it is it is just fascinating that this this here, there's there's evidence, and there's been evidence for a long, long time. I think you had, you cited one study that was done back in 1969, and it never got discussed again until 2009. Yeah. So the the history of for ketogenic diets in particular, the history of ketogenic diets for epilepsy is, is very similar to the history of ketogenic diets for, for, for diabetes uh, and obesity, um, which is that, you know, back in 1921, when there really were no useful seizure medications available, and there were children having these, you know, multiple seizures per day and nothing was helping, you know, apparently people had known for thousands of years that, you know, when people fast, their seizures can can go away. And so the ketogenic diet, we think of it as a weight loss diet, but really it was designed in 1921 to try, it was a diet that was trying to get as close to fasting as possible without starving people to death. So yeah. it's a very strict <laughs> ketogenic diet, but it worked. I mean, it helped most kids with epilepsy and and, but then medications came along you know, at some point in the middle of the, I think in the middle of the 20th century. And then the ketogenic diet for epilepsy kind of got buried until, you know, a, a, a family who, you know, happened to have a filmmaker in it, um, rediscovered it for their own child and started the Charlie Foundation. And so the same thing with ketogenic diets for, for so ketogenic diets for mental health. Um, you said there was this study back in the 60s where, um, there were 10 women with schizophrenia who were in, in the hospital and their doctors, for whatever reason, decided to try a ketogenic diet. And they wrote a paper. It's not very, it's not very clearly described. It's not a lot of detail, but they say that all 10 of them improved after a couple of weeks on a ketogenic diet. And then nothing happened <laughs> from you know that time until 2009, when Dr. Eric Westman at Duke University put a woman with serious mental illness, schizophrenia, um, on a low carbohydrate diet for weight loss. And lo and behold, her schizophrenia improved. And he published that case report in 2009. It was the first well-documented case of a person with serious mental illness, and she'd been ill for decades, 
uh, hallucinations and all kinds of other serious symptoms, disabled, um, was able to come completely off uh, antipsychotic medication and remained off medication for the rest of her life, which I think about 12 years or so. And uh, she, um, uh, what was I gonna say about that? That she uh, not only came off all that, uh, that uh, psychiatric medication, but she had started improving within eight days of starting the diet. So these are really powerful, efficient uh, um, interventions that I think everybody with a mental health condition needs to know about, deserves to know about from day one of their treatment process so that they know that this is an option that they can explore that could bring them substantial relief. And even in many cases, with a lot of documented cases of this, we've even seen complete recovery from even very serious mental illnesses uh, using these dietary interventions. One thing you, you did in the book, you, you listed cholesterol as a macronutrient. And I, before I go too far down, I don't want to, you also are very clear that, you know, there are macronutrients we need like protein because there's amino acids we can't produce and essential fatty acids that we can't produce. So there, we do need fat and protein in our diet. We don't necessarily need carbohydrates because our body can make those, but yeah. you listed cholesterol as a macronutrient. So can you kind of take us through that? Because this is the first time I've, I've seen it included in there, which would indicate it's not this evil thing that's killing us, but might actually be something that, that could be necessary for our well being. It might be. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm glad you, you noticed that that's something that I've never really talked about before in an interview is that, I struggled with what to call it because, um, you know, carbohydrate. Uh, so, so there, we usually think about three macronutrients. We think about um, fat, protein, carbohydrate, right? And we're usually told, oh, you know, fat doesn't really matter. You can eat as, the less of that you eat, the better. And we're told that you know, carbohydrate should be like forty to sixty-five percent of our diet. And protein, you know, a lot of people agree about protein that's essential, and you have to have a certain amount, right? So. Um, we could argue all day long about how much protein you should have, but we all agree you should have some, right? So one thing that is a biological truth fact uh, is that carbohydrate is not an essential macronutrient. It's entirely optional. And the reason for that is you can make it yourself inside your body. So you're, you can make all the glucose and carbohydrate, all the blood sugar you need to feed all of the cells of your body, including your brain, um, smoothly and reliably all day long, all night long from fat and protein. So you could get it from outside your body by eating sugars and starches. If you want to, you can do that, but you don't have to. You can make it yourself. And in fact, if you make it yourself, it's safer because you're not gonna get a lot of those peaks and valleys and unpredictability depending on the quality of carbohydrates you're eating, or maybe you're eating too much for your personal metabolism. Your body knows how much you need. So it will make the right amount and it will not cause it will not give you these sort of spikes and crashes, right? It won't do that. So if you choose to get it from the outside, it's riskier. You make it from the inside, it's it's safer. But we 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 never think about cholesterol as a macronutrient. Um uh I like to think about it as a macronutrient because um if carbohydrate is then so is cholesterol. Meaning, you know, our cells can make cholesterol. Um, so in fact, most of the cholesterol in your body does not come from your food. Most of the cholesterol in your body is made by your very own cells. And just about every cell in the body has the machinery to make cholesterol. And it's a really complicated molecule to build. And yet just about every cell is capable of making it. Why? <laughs> Why are your cells designed to make cholesterol and especially the brain? So the brain uh, ha is extremely rich in cholesterol, uh, um, about uh, 10 times more than you would expect it should have. And not a single molecule of that cholesterol comes from your, the food you eat or from your bloodstream because cholesterol is too big and bulky to cross into the brain, across the blood-brain barrier. So the brain makes every single molecule of all that cholesterol that's up there itself on purpose from scratch. And what I like to say is, you know, you know, why would the brain go out of its way to make all of these molecules that are dangerous for you? It wouldn't. It's really smart. It's a brain. It's making on purpose because every membrane in your brain and body has cholesterol in it 
on purpose, it, it, without cholesterol, your membranes, would, your cells would fall apart. This is a vital molecule for, for animal life and health. So I view it as a macronutrient as much as carbohydrate is, meaning you can make all the cholesterol inside your body or you can eat it. It's your choice. It's a, it's a macronutrient. It's optional in the diet, but it is absolutely essential. Yeah, I think it also plays a part in some of the hormones that we have circulating through our bodies as well. So <laughs> yeah, yes. if, you, if, you, if you don't want those, then yeah, then 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 do this. Um, well, the other thing, the other thing that I think is important, and a lot of people won't try the, the ketogenic diet, because they're really just kind of afraid they can't stick to it. And I've always been of the mindset that, um, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, is that uh, ketosis can be a protocol, a protocol to deal with illnesses. Like we talked about epilepsy and diabetes. We're going to talk about some of the um, mental health issues that it can also help us with, but there's a benefit in our body for us to be able to shift and, and use both to use some glucose effectively and to use ketones effectively and to be able to go back and forth. It is called metabolic flexibility. It's a, it's a huge competitive advantage that a human has to be able to survive on either of those fuel sources. Can you tell us a little bit why that's the case and why we should look to periods of time when we are, are in ketosis and periods of time when maybe we're not? Oh, this is great. So, uh, um, so this topic is so important because people, people think about ketosis as an all or nothing thing, right? Like I either have to be on a ketogenic diet every single day for the rest of my life, which almost nobody can imagine committing to that. Or they think, uh, oh, ketosis is dangerous. I'm, I'm not supposed to be in ketosis. This is, it's dangerous. Um, it's only, or it's only for dire circumstances, like se serious illnesses, like brain cancer or, uh, type two diabetes where, you know, you have severe metabolic damage or maybe, a, maybe a very serious uh, condition like Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that's not true. That's a, that's a very black and white way of looking at things. And the body isn't black and white. The body, as you said, is designed to be metabolically flexible. I mean, how long would we've lasted as a species if we, if we could only run our bodies on one kind of fuel, it's going to depend on what's around you at the time. If you're surrounded by plants, eat plants. If you're surrounded by animals, eat animals. And so, you know, eat, you know, fuel yourself and the body will, will figure out how to do it, right? So, um, so we can burn fat and we can burn carbohydrate. Um, and, but, but what I, I make this point in the book, and I, and this is why I really appreciate what you asked is that um, you're, you're picking this piece out of the book that I think is so important is that I'm convinced by having learned the, the biochemistry of all this, the metabolic truth of all this is that even if you don't have obesity or type two diabetes or some serious mental health condition or neurological condition or cancer, I still think um, uh, that we all benefit from, from spending at least some time in ketosis on a regular basis, because it's only when you're in ketosis that you a whole different set of pathways shifts into gear that are really important for health maintenance. And this is, you know, things like recycling pathways and um, maintenance pathways and healing pathways. Because if you're if you're constantly burning carbohydrates for energy, um, all if you're burning carbohydrates, you're trying to burn carbohydrates all the time, then your your insulin levels are going to be higher. And when, when glucose and insulin levels are, when, when, when insulin levels are, are high, even if they're not, even if they're not too high, if you're just in kind of in this insulin driven state of, okay, we're going to be burning carbohydrates for energy. We're going to be using carbohydrates to build things. We're going to be carbohydrate fueled. If you're doing that all the time, those pathways that are using glucose, uh, blood sugar, to, to, to all this, all the cell operations are being run using glucose, then you're kind of, it's, it's as though you've got your foot on the gas pedal all the time and you, you never get a chance to, to, to let up and heal and relax and recover uh, and, and uh, rebuild for the next day, right? So we, I think we're designed to go into ketosis overnight. And if you're eating a healthy diet, 
and your metabolism isn't too broken already, even if you're just eating whole foods, um, fruits, but kind of a paleo style diet, I think that's probably what was happening is that your insulin levels would come down every night enough to turn on fat burning and let some of those healing pathways take over. And then you could start eating again the next day. And that this is the, this is the, the, the benefit of, of intermittent fasting too, is that you, you take the pressure off that glucose insulin system um, and, and you let things quiet down. And if you don't, sh- if you're not able to shift back and forth like that, your your long-term health will suffer. You, you don't want to be in overdrive all the time. Yeah. Plus, our body's creating ages, um, advanced glycation units, which is gunk. So you're, you know, like you said, you're oh, basically, yes. <laughs> you, you're gunking up your system and your brain and everything else. And as a result of not shifting out of that to what's effectively a cleaner fuel, um, you're just, you're letting your brain and you're letting your body just gunk up, I guess the best way for me to say it is <laughs> sticky. Um, yeah. um, okay. Now, because this is so tied together, I, and I think more people will think about type two diabetes because what half of us, <laughs> half of us are probably in pre-diabetes or worse in the United States. And I read where you know, half of us in 2030 are going to probably be obese. And this is not just adults, but everybody. And so obese, obesity and type 2 diabetes uh, is going to affect every human being on this planet at some point or another, whether it's you or somebody close to you. And so I want to take them through this, this concept of how insulin sensitivity is really kind of the gauge because we, we tend to measure sugar so we'll measure our, our fasting glucose when we go to the doctor. They give us, you know, take some blood, fasting glucose, A1C, which is a, kind of a measure of that gunk I was talking about in a minute ago. But it's we're measuring that to say how much sugar is in your system, but that's not the actual answer that's the most important one. It's how much insulin is in our system. We don't typically measure that directly all the time. Um, it's a special different test, but we don't measure it the same or as often. Um, tell us why insulin sensitivity is such a huge thing for us. And then kind of walk us through, cause you put three phases of this. And I like this. I, I like this because it, it explains that you're getting sick before you're sick. And we miss that, <laughs> you know, Oh, it's pre-diabetes. My doctor says, if I don't do something, then this will happen. But that's if, and then when, right. And, and, but we're getting sick. If we have an insulin problem, we're getting sick day one. It's just a function of not having the symptoms or the measurements that are necessary to reach a diagnosis. Can you kind of talk us through all that? Cause that was fascinating. Yes. Thank you again. These, these topics that you're choosing are just so uh, important. Um, so yes. So more than half of us now have this condition called insulin resistance, which is sometimes also called pre-diabetes, because as you said, if, you know, um, uh, it, it often over a long period of time, it can take up to 20 years for, for pre-diabetes to become type two, full-fledged, full-blown type two diabetes. And, and, and so that's why it's often called pre-diabetes. But in the, what insulin resistance actually is, if it's not a blood sugar problem, it's an insulin problem. So, um, so when you, what your doctor measures, when you go for your annual physical, they measure your fasting blood glucose, your fasting blood sugar, after you haven't eaten all night, um, and your, and, and your hemoglobin A1C, which as you said, is a measure of how much sugar has stuck to your red blood cells. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and so isn't that interesting, right? So how sticky are your red blood cells? I mean, they shouldn't be sticky. <laughs> we don't want them to be sticky. So, so in any case, those are the tests they give you. Those are great tests for type two diabetes, but they are not useful tests for the 20 year long train that's coming uh, down the tracks and is going to hit you 20 years later. Do you want to know if you already have type two diabetes or do you want to know that you're already on the road to type two diabetes? And do you want to know what you can do about it to turn the train around? Because it actually just takes a few few days to weeks to get yourself off of that that train track it's very simple not necessarily easy but simple and so so what you really want to know 
okay, so your fasting blood sugar, by the time your fasting blood sugar is too high, um, you know, that the, the, you know, the, the, the train has already hit you, right? You want to know how much insulin is it taking to keep that blood sugar normal all those years before it can't do it anymore. So insulin is working harder and harder and harder to deal with all that sugar and starch that you've been feeding it three, four, five, six times a day. And the insulin levels climb and climb and your body becomes more and more resistant to it over the years. It's kind of, you know, resisting its, its uh, signals. It's trying to protect itself from being overstimulated by insulin. The more, the more you eat this way, the higher insulin levels climb, the higher it has to work. And at and, and a certain point, it can't keep your glucose under control anymore. And that's type two diabetes. So what you really want to measure is your fasting insulin level. You want to know how much insulin is your body having to crank out every day to keep your blood sugar normal. That's the real test. And, and you can get your fasting insulin levels down to normal within a matter of days and, and protect yourself from all kinds of problems. You know, really, if you're looking at your fa uh, fasting insulin and other measures of insulin resistance, uh, there's a few other ones like high triglycerides. So if your triglycerides above 100, if your waist circumference is more than half your height, um, if your HDL is below 40, um, if your fasting insulin is uh, above 10, like these are some great, great uh, simple measures of insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, it's kind of like a crystal ball. Like it, 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 it's a, a win, it's, it's a, a vision of your health future. Because if you have insulin resistance, you can look into that crystal ball. You won't, might not be able to see exactly which things are going to go wrong, but you can be guaranteed that something is going to go wrong. It might be Alzheimer's. It might be type two diabetes. It might be, um, you know, ever worsening uh, weight gain. It might be heart disease. Uh, it might be cancer, uh, fatty liver disease. I mean, you name it. Most of the conditions that we fear are driven by insulin resistance in some large part. So that's your, that's your control. That's your lever. That's the, you have tremendous power over your future, your health future. If you get control of that insulin. Now in the book, you talked about a few different uh, ways of eating. You talked about paleo and you talked about keto. You kind of twisted them a little bit in, in that there's particular food items you've, you've plucked out and said th these let's do paleo without this. Let's do keto without that. Uh, I don't want to dive too deep into it because this is why you get this book. Because if you're having <laughs> brain fog uh, or you're dealing with depression or other things, uh, there's some ways to eat in this book that I think are they're hypercritical, including food plans for you to start figuring out if nutrition particularly as the therapy can help you. And there's no danger to do this. It's like, like, seriously, just, you can just do it. But I just want to step forward though and say, okay, why, why is the ketogenic diet a great way to improve our brain health and particularly the types of things like we, I think some of us heard Alzheimer's is now kind of being referred to as type three diabetes uh, I guess we're going to have to go through the rest of them and say depression and migraines and, and all these other things are four or fives, <laughs> but they're, they're all basically right, right. the same thing. Uh, it's just different um, symptoms, uh, outward symptoms of the same insulin problem. But why is the ketogenic diet the right way to approach solving this problem? Yeah. So the ketogenic diet is unique in its ability to, uh, to heal the brain. Uh, and, and energize the brain differently than other diets do. And so the problem with uh, insulin resistance, we know that in the body, it can eventually lead to high blood sugar levels and other issues and weight gain and so forth, because insulin is what turns on your fat storage hormone. So that's what tells you to store all this extra calories as fat. So we, we have a, a really deep understanding of insulin in the body. And we actually have a deep understanding of insulin in the brain too. It's just that most people haven't heard about it yet which is another reason why I wrote the book. So if you have high insulin levels, so over time, if your blood sugar and blood insulin levels are running too high too often, there are two things that are going to happen. One is 
your blood sugar levels, your, your, your sugar levels are also going to be uh, uh, right, uh, too high too often in the brain as well. So that's problem number one is that too much sugar in the brain is damaging. Uh, you, every time you eat the wrong way, you're going to get a wave of inflammation and a wave of something called oxidative stress inside the brain, which is why we're always told we're supposed to eat all these antioxidants, which by the way, don't work. But um, so, you know, so you get, when you're eating too, your diet is too sugary or too starchy, waves of inflammation and oxidative stress uh, and, uh, and all kinds of neurotransmitter imbalances and damage inside the brain. So that's one huge problem. The other huge problem you're going to have is that the, the higher your insulin levels run, the harder it is for insulin to cross into the brain. Your brain becomes insulin resistant. So it becomes harder and harder for insulin to cross. And glucose still waltzes in, no questions asked. You don't need to worry about low brain glucose. You don't need to worry about that. If you have insulin resistance, you need to worry about low brain insulin. Now, why does that matter? Because every cell in the brain has an insulin receptor. Why does it have the, it needs, the brain needs insulin. And the, the, it needs it for many, many things. But most importantly, the brain cannot turn glucose, blood sugar, into energy to full capacity, efficiently and properly without adequate insulin. So your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be slowly starving to death if you don't have enough insulin. And that's what's happening for every single person who has insulin resistance is facing this slowly mounting, silent in the background, brain energy crisis. And by the time you notice any memory problems, you're, uh, you can have lost up to 25% of your brain's glucose processing power. So this is not good. What a, now, what a ketogenic diet does, the magic of a ketogenic diet is that when you eat a ketogenic diet, your insulin levels come down beautifully. You can't make ketones, you can't burn fat and make ketones unless your insulin levels are low. So you eat in a way that lowers your insulin levels, that turns on fat burning, that you chop that fat into some of that fat into ketones, ketones travel up to the brain, cross easily into the brain, and they bridge that energy gap. So if you've got cells that have been just kind of sputtering along and not quite enough energy for years, if they haven't died yet, and they, they will, <laughs> if they yeah. haven't died yet, you can revive them. You can re-energize them with ketones. It's the only fuel uh, option that you have that's going to be safe to burn inside the low insulin brain because ketones burn beautifully in a low insulin environment. So now you've got this um, you've re-energized your brain, you've revitalized its metabolism. And when people try a ketogenic diet, I see this every day in my practice, uh, and many of my colleagues do too. If it, within days, often people feel like their brain wakes up. Wow. The brain fog's gone. I've mental clarity. I've mental energy. I've mental stamina. I can get things done. I, you know, I feel better. My mood is uh, more even, uh, it's just, it's a different state of mind. Yeah. And, and I, I, really we're not just talking about feeling better or brain fog. This, I mean, some of the case studies you have, you talked about schizophrenia, there's depression. Um, you talked a little bit about migraines. I know one of, one of the listeners on the Facebook group had mentioned wanting to understand ketones and migraines. That's, that's in the book. Um, so this is a protocol now for someone who's really suffering and you're working with a doctor and then basically you want to start using ketosis as a protocol. This is probably, probably is something that you would want to do almost full time. Or is this something like someone who's has depression can go into ketosis for a period of time and then return back to eating more of a keto, I mean, a paleo style diet, or how, how would that work out? Yeah, that's a great question too. So, um, you know, do people with serious health conditions, mental health conditions and physical health conditions need to be in ketosis all the time, or can they just be in ketosis on and off or can they, or, or, uh, can they go on for a while and then stop and go back to eating more normally? So we know in children, 
uh, that um, a children with epilepsy in many cases only needed to be on a ketogenic diet for a year or two uh, to get control of very serious frequent seizures. And then they could go back to eating normally uh, and remain seizure free uh, uh, long term. And so we know that's possible for children with epilepsy. We don't yet have enough research or experience to know how often you can see this with mental health problems in adults. But I can tell you from my clinical experience that most of my patients do not have that metabolic flexibility to be able to go off the ketogenic diet and, and, and remain well. Most of my patients, uh, when, they, when the diet gets interrupted, as I like to say, if the diet gets interrupted for whatever reason, most of them do experience their symptoms coming back pretty quickly, often within 24 to 48 hours. So, but everybody's different. I do have a handful of patients who are more metabolically flexible, metabolically healthier, uh, who knows exactly why some of these people do better. But after they've experienced, you know, the, the um, healing properties of the ketogenic diet after a year or two, say, they can, they, they do seem to have a little bit more wiggle room with their carbohydrate intake without having to have a relapse of their symptoms than a lot of my other patients do. And at least, I mean, again, this is not clinical research. This is just my experience talking. Those people, for the most part, are the ones who are, and this comes back to your work, physically fit. So the people who have a lot, a lot more muscle, they're fit, they exercise regularly, um, they seem to be metabolically healthier, which is no surprise. And they seem, and because as we know, working muscles soak up glucose like a sponge, no insulin required. So the muscle cells let glucose in, they can clear away. If you're, if you're having a day when you're eating a lot more sugar or starch, you're having a day off from your diet. If you exercise, you will do yourself a big favor by clearing some of that excess glucose out of the bloodstream without get without needing an insulin spike to do it. So there's a tremendous benefit. You know, I, I like to say that, you know, these are, um, you know, uh, metabolic health is not just about diet, it's about exercise too. And these are the two, these are your two pillars um, that and so going outside and getting some sunlight and, yeah. and, and some <laughs> other good things. But uh, uh, so, but, you know, diet is king and exercise is queen as one of my trainees once said. Um, I really like that, um, that way of thinking about it. Yeah. I, you know, one thing I, I do want to be clear is when we say go back to eating regularly, uh, we don't mean the standard American diet with all the processed and ultra processed and the crap. This is going back to eating still a real food, whole food type of diet. It's just yes. bringing in some additional plant-based carbohydrates, um, like we're talking potatoes, sweet potatoes, things that you might, or fruit even, that you might avoid if you're trying to stay into ketosis and your threshold for glucose is relatively low, you know, you can reintroduce some of these things and maybe feel fine. Uh, but it's it's not like going back and saying, okay, here, I'm going to have a big box of Cheetos and then I'm going to chase that down with some Oreos. Uh, not not going to not gonna work uh, at all. Um, <laughs> but they're grains, so what can I say? Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Dr. E, I, I just, I just find wellness as being the healthiest, fittest and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Yeah. So, uh, you want to, you want to understand what, so, so it's diet, exercise and, 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 uh, time outdoors, right? So those are for your metabolic health. Those, I think the three most important things, uh, so, but, but a healthy diet, what does that mean? Most of us have the wrong definition of what a healthy diet is. Most of us have been feeding our brains and the rest of our bodies improperly our entire lives because we've been given the wrong advice. And that advice does not work. No, it doesn't work. It's dangerous. So if you understand how to rebuild your diet from the ground up in ways that make biological sense, um, that's going to uh, protect you against most of the chronic diseases we fear. So it's about nourishing the brain by, so my definition of a brain healthy diet, right? Which is healthy for the rest of the body as well, because it wouldn't make sense to need a different diet for every different organ in your body. Nourish 
the, your brain needs to be nourishing by providing all essential nutrients. It needs to be uh, protect your brain against damage. So you remove the the uh, all the refined carbohydrates and the vegetable oils and the grains and the legumes and so forth. And then it needs to uh, energize the brain and the rest of your body by, and this is, it's really almost this simple, keeping your blood sugar and your insulin levels in a healthy range. Get tested for insulin resistance. Most of these tests you can do at home, you've probably already had. If you have insulin resistance, you're going to need to uh, get that, uh, get those insulin levels down. And and those are, those are the three things that I would recommend. Okay. Well, doctor, if someone wanted to learn more about you and your book, change your diet, change your mind, where would you like for me to send them? Uh, the best place is my website, which is called diagnosisdiet.com. Uh, and so there's uh, information about the book there, but there's also, uh, for people who are interested in using ketogenic diets to treat, uh, any kind of condition, really, including mental health conditions, there's a free clinician directory that you can search, uh, for a clinician in your area who will support you uh, to safely transition onto a ketogenic diet, because there is some medical supervision required in that case, because it is such a powerful intervention, especially if you're taking certain medications yes. or have certain health issues. So, so, so the directory is there. Um, and there's also training programs there for clinicians if they're interested. So lots of, inf but, but uh, that, that'd be the, that, that's where I would go. <laughs> okay. You can go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash six, three, five. And I'll be sure to have the links there. Dr. Ede, thank you so much for being a part of 40 plus fitness. I cannot thank you enough. I thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Ellen. You know, there's a lot of things to talk about here, but right off the bat, from the very beginning, you both discussed when it's time sometimes to restructure your diet. And just that phrase, I just, I want people to put that phrase in their brains for a minute and consider, you know, eating in a way that fuels and, and helps your body in that moment. You know, I, I, you know, I have a hang up with when people think, um, the diet should be sustainable. We talk about it all the time. You know, once you're a vegan, you're always a vegan. And it's not that it's not at all the case. Like our bodies go through these massive changes. I'm going through menopause and it's time exactly to restructure my diet. And I just thought that was a great term to start with. Yeah. You know, it, too often we, we, we get these phrases in our head and we start thinking, mm -hmm. And then, or we don't, we completely don't think. So we're, we're <laughs> at, at extremes of, you know, yeah, I'm a vegan or yeah, I'm eating keto or yes, I'm a carnivore, um, mm -hmm. roar. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is, you know, and, and, and I see it, I see it every day. Cause you know, I, of course I'm on Facebook, I'm in these groups and I'm paying attention and someone says, well, um, what, what, what's a, what's a keto coffee that I can order at Starbucks? And I'm like, oh. mm -hmm black coffee that's, yeah, that's just, I was gonna say. <laughs> straight up black yeah, yeah just actually order a copy um, <laughs> yeah. but th they're so caught up in the the concept of can i eat you know mm -hmm. this like uh, in the carnivore group it's like you know can i can i have um you know a little bit of um, this fruit mm -hmm. and and i'm like no one's going to come to your house and arrest right. you for having a little bit of fruit if you want a little mm -hmm. bit of fruit is it carnivore? No, it's not. But who says you have to be 100% carnivore? Know, yeah. um, and, and so it, it, we get trapped up in this and, and, mm -hmm. and it, you know, people wanting to be perfect on these types of things. And then you get the exact opposite, the person that pays no attention to what they're eating, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they eat mindlessly. Uh, mm -hmm. They're, they're driving, they're watching TV, they're doing other things, and they're not even paying attention to the food. Mm -hmm. And they're overeating in most cases, mm -hmm. and they're not getting nutrition. So they're overfed and malnutrition um, mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And so they feel like crap, and then their body starts to put on body fat, and that's where they are. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, it's worth every once in a while just taking a step back. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of logging your food every day, right? unless you feel like you need to, to have some stability. But- mm -hmm sitting down for a day or two and saying, okay, what's in my cupboard and what have I been eating the last few days and realizing, yeah. you know, you went through half a box of vanilla wafers, uh, that you had bought for the grandchild. Mm -hmm. They ate one 
<laughs> and you ate the rest of them. Yeah. Um, you know, vanilla wafers not might not be something you need to keep in your cupboard um, if you're going to be eating most of them. Um, right. So just wow. those types of things were just taking a little bit of time to analyze what you're doing mm-hmm. so you can make better choices. I like to say, if you can measure it, you can monitor it. And like you said, sometimes we just don't pay attention to what we're eating. And, and I do the same thing every now and then I need to go back and say, am I getting enough protein in these meals? Like, you know, what, how much am I really snacking and how many calories are there in what I define as a handful, but what the package says is a serving, you know, it, 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 it does make sense to go back and, and measure and, and see what's actually happening. But I, I love this conversation about keto. I always like to hear um, how it has helped people in different ways. And the 1969 study and the 2009 study, it sounded like they were um, looking at people for losing weight, but also addressing some serious mental health issues. That was, and yeah. both of those are interesting studies and research for that time. Yeah. Well, the, the, the 69 study should have been enough uh-huh. for them to do more work. Right. Okay, but be, because the ketogenic diet did not follow the mainstream narrative of mm-hmm. low fat, stay away from meat, since mm-hmm. it didn't follow that, you know, it followed the general meals um, kind of model of you need more cereal, shut up and eat your cereal. Yeah. yeah, eat your cereal, <laughs> eat your bread, eat, eat mm-hmm. this crap. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it went against all that. So the, the political push was against it. So no one else followed that up. It was dead, it, dead to science as far as they were concerned because it didn't give them the answer they wanted mm-hmm. for the mainstream media, the mainstream narrative, it, you know, medical, uh, pharmaceutical, all of it, <laughs> food, all of it. It didn't mm-hmm. go along with. They would rather you have to have a pill to address that medical concern than food. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause they make money on the pill. They don't make money on the food. Okay. So that happens. Now what happened in 2009 was Eric Westman. He's a, he's a doc, doctor that works out of Duke and he's a very, very much a low carb guy. He's on a speaking tour. He's a really cool guy. I've, I've met him before. And, um, what he does there at his, uh, his clinic is basically a weight loss clinic. And so this mm-hmm. woman who had, uh, symptoms of schizophrenia, came in for weight loss. And so he put her on a ketogenic diet. She lost the weight and her condition improved. And so this is a case study. It's not going to really stand out as um, full science. Uh, And the other one was a relatively low volume of people. I think it was 10 maybe. So 10 or so, yeah. Again, so in either case, neither of these would be considered like compelling science. But that said, most science is so bad because what they're doing is they're saying, okay, how many vanilla wafers did you eat per, per week on average last year? And right. so we might be able to say, well, I, I don't eat, I haven't had any vanilla wafers, but then as they go through other food items, I'm like, mm-hmm. well, how many, how many slices of bread, mm-hmm. you know, how many crackers, you know, how many, uh, servings of rice, how many servings of pasta. And so you start getting like, gee, how many servings of pasta do I eat? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, real, really, uh, I don't measure it. So I don't really know. So I'm going to guess, I would just guess. Yeah, exactly. And so you, you guess and you guess and you're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) It's not that you're intentionally wrong. It's just, you don't remember and you don't have information to fall back on. And so Mm -hmm. you make these guesses and then they're using that as science Mm -hmm. and they're saying, Oh, well, people who eat meat, um, you know, red and processed. So they put that on the same line, red and processed meat. Uh, yeah. We've noticed a higher indication of um, cancer. Mm-hmm. Now, did they ask these same people and break it up and say, well, do you smoke or do you not smoke? You know, right. what's your family life like? What's your stress level like? What's your sleep like? And then to go out and find it's like, well, it just happens that the people who are m- less inclined to pay attention to what they're eating mm-hmm. and just eat what's there, Well, those individuals are also likely to have other health uh, harming uh, lifestyle choices. And as Mm -hmm. a result, that's why they're struggling. And so it's really hard when you start asking people to do that. And and it's, but it's very expensive to do an extended study. 
The yeah. reason they could do 10 people was that those 10 people were in a, a, a facility so they could monitor what they were doing. The reason that Dr. Westman was able to do it, it was because he had one patient and he was able mm -hmm. to specifically work with her on her food and manage her through it. So if he, he, he can do that because it's a client and it's, you know, it's done in a medical facility and it's a part of Duke's studies and stuff. But it's re it'd be really, really expensive to do thousands of people that way. Oh, yeah. So they can't, and they can't do it long enough. So the science isn't going to be there. But what, what, this, what this should tell you is that there is evidence out there that the ketogenic diet can be effective in helping you manage mental health issues. Um, is it the full answer? No, you still need to do the other stuff. And if the doctor says you need to be on a medication, do what the doctor says, but... Mm -hmm. Put yourself on a way of eating that you can sustain that works for you. Mm -hmm. And that's an N equals one experiment where N is the sample size. So you mm -hmm. say N equals, okay. So for that study we talked about before in 69, that was N equals 10. In mm -hmm. this case, N equals one, but this is the most important one because this is you. Right. So you're not relying on what happened to that woman at Duke. You're relying on what is going on with you. So mm -hmm. if you are able to cut out carbohydrates and get on a low carb diet and maybe even into ketosis, and you notice that your migraines go away and you notice that you start feeling better, the brain fog goes away and all those things, there's your evidence. There's your study, draw mm -hmm. your conclusion and act appropriately. Yeah. I love that. And I just want to point out, it's not something that it, this isn't a week long change. If you're going to commit to a different way of eating, if you're actually going to restructure your diet, you've got to give it time, regardless of whether you go keto or vegan or any other way, you know, you got to give it time to actually for your body to adapt and, and make, make some changes. Yeah. The information's here. You know, the point is, is the information is here. And mm -hmm. the studies were there. They're, they're, this information, information has always been here. I was born in 66. Mm -hmm. So I was three years old when this study came out. Um, <laughs> that's been here. That's That's yeah. been there. And so the information is there. If you're looking for answers, uh, mm -hmm. it's not all that complicated. And I can make it any, even easier. Yeah. Eat real food. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to feel better. You're going to be healthier. Your body's going to respond. You're going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. You're going to have more energy and your body's going to respond. You're going to yep. heal and you're going to be able to move better and your whole life will be better, but you've got to sure. start and it, make it as simple as possible. Eat real food. That's a good place to you start know, for sure. There are no vanilla wafer trees. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's perfect. All right. Well, I guess I'll talk to you next week. Great. Take care, Alan. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed today's show, take a moment to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And if you would, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss how to get and stay fit over 40. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.